Okay, hi there everybody, it's Frank Leone again, uh, chapter two of my uh, reminiscing about being Ryan's father during uh, some pretty interesting years uh, uh, in, the 20, in the very beginning of the 21st century. When I signed off my first uh, video, my first YouTube video here, uh, we were just turning into the beginning of 2001. Ryan had uh, left three different schools, uh, the first one semi-voluntarily, the second one totally voluntary, and the third one uh, expelled, uh, and really didn't have anywhere to go. Um, uh, there was a possibility of his going back to Santa Barbara High, but uh, by and large, in uh, the first month or two of the new year, uh, he just had no interest in going to school at all, and we were sort of wallowing around trying to figure out what to do with him. And another thing that I, looking back, I've, I've learned is that the first inclination for any parent is to throw money at the problem, uh, to hire specialists to look into it, uh, obviously to send to various rehab and schools and things of that sort. Uh, and indeed, all of this uh, uh, came to pass uh, at this point. Uh, for the first month or two uh, after the, the beginning of uh, 2001, Ryan was uh, uh, just basically doing nothing. He had no desire to go to school. Uh, 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 you know, whether he could have even gotten back into Santa Barbara High uh, at this point is uh, uncertain. Uh, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of other options uh, for him. Uh, but even if there was, uh, his uh, mindset was that he simply didn't want to uh, uh, go to school. And he was really uh, uh, basically living a dreadful life. Uh, I don't think alcohol had been much of an issue at this point, although uh, so often at that age, most young people experiment with it. But the drugs seemed to be getting more pronounced. Uh, I don't know exactly when things like cocaine and LSD kicked in. I know mushrooms kicked in by this point. I know marijuana was... Uh, probably daily even at this point. Uh, and obviously there was no source of income. So that basically led him to uh, do things uh, to his family that were very, very uh, hurtful and harmful. Uh, stealing money, stealing credit cards, uh, 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 taking things and bringing them to a, a hawk shop, things that were valuable to us, uh, valuable to him. Uh, a couple years earlier, we bought him this beautiful guitar because he expressed interest in uh, learning how to play, and I remember that one in particular, he, he brought to uh, a pawn shop and in order to get money to support his various habits. So we knew that we had to do something. So we retained uh, an, uh, a, a consultant, educational special needs, not special needs for uh, developmental disabilities, but special needs for students that are, uh, are, are otherwise uh, uh, challenged in their schooling. Uh, and uh, she basically recommended that we enroll Ryan in uh, one of these uh, uh, schools that are out there all over the country that serve as sort of dual purpose situations where you uh, are actually in there for alcohol or drug rehab, but you can also pursue your studies, your academic studies as well. And they tend to be in isolated areas where uh, you can't really run away. They tend to be fairly hard-nosed about it. It's not a it's not a summer camp. It's <clears throat> excuse me much more uh, strict and stringent than that. Uh, it's basically populated by uh, a lot of troubled young people, young teenagers, young uh, uh, adolescents, and so forth. So we looked around, and it turned out that this consultant uh, had a son who was the headmaster of a uh, program that's fairly well known in Park City, Utah. So uh, she was really touting that as where he should go. But I said, well, are there other options? It was almost like applying to a college. I wanted to have a couple other options. And I thought it would be a really good idea if we took a look at more than one, my wife and I, so we'd have a sense of what might be the best fit for Ryan. Uh, and Ryan had a pretty good sense that somewhere along the line, something was going to have to break. Uh, because he couldn't live his life like this at the age of 15. So what was interesting is that uh, Ryan had to come in for an interview with her. She said it would be very, very valuable to get to meet Ryan face to face. So I said, Ryan, at two o'clock you're meeting so-and-so at her home office uh, here in the Santa Barbara area. 
and uh, and I brought Ryan over there. I didn't know it at the time, and again, uh, naivety and denial is such a an incredible um, a problem uh, when a parent is dealing with a loved child like like Ryan uh, is and continues to be for us. Uh, uh, so Ryan went into that, but it turned out that Ryan was basically impossible to interview uh, because he was on mushrooms. He got on mushrooms before this interview, almost like getting on marijuana before the interview at the Catholic high school that he went to for a short period of time. Uh, so what happened was that we indeed had applied to that school, but uh, she was so offended by Ryan, understandably so probably, that uh, she uh, nixed the deal. She basically gave him a thumbs down recommendation, but we didn't know it at the time. So what we arranged to do, and again, you can arrange it through somebody like her, and she arranged it, is uh, there at the time, and I presume there still is, were mechanisms whereby you can come and uh, hire these people, uh, big, bur two big burly people that show up about 2.30 in the morning, and prearranged at our home to go into Ryan's bedroom and basically uh, tell Ryan, uh, get dressed, you're coming with us and you don't need a whole lot with you, we, uh, we have it, uh, and we're going to take a plane ride. Uh, and uh, I don't know how Ryan uh, uh, adapted to that, but I know that uh, we were asleep in our room and know that Ryan left and how, how heartbreaking it is to know that potentially against his will, your 15-year-old uh, child is, is being taken away to some place that you've never been uh, for God knows what kind of, of training, although we had some uh, verification that it was uh, you know, a very uh, appropriate and good program. The program was called SEUS, S-E-U-S, as I remember, maybe S-U-E-S, I don't remember. Uh, and it was in rural Idaho, and it was basically rural wilderness training. Uh, and uh, they, these two guys, at no small expense, uh, took him on an airplane up to Idaho, and then I guess they got in a car and brought him up to where he had to go in Idaho, and he was there for three weeks. And uh, then they arranged, and, and then during those three weeks, uh, my wife and I uh, went to Salt Lake City, went over to Park City to take a look at uh, the Oakley School, which uh, uh, was one of the possibilities. Uh, and then we went to another one. I researched and see what else might be available in Utah, since we're going to be in Utah looking at the first school, which is presumably our first choice. And uh, we found out there was one several hours, probably two and a half to three hours south of Salt Lake City in a totally isolated place called Loa, L-O-A, Utah. And we went down there as well. And there was a pretty big contrast between the two facilities. Oakley almost looked like a, a classic, high-quality private high school. And it was in a bit more of an urban area. I mean, it was blocks away from the heart of, you know, this... Uh, uh, classic ski resort in Park City, and the one uh, uh, in Loa was really stark. It was like a couple of buildings in the middle of nowhere and a sort of a depressing kind of place and seemed like it would be a lot harsher and maybe less academic and more focused on uh, straightening uh, young people out. Uh, so we wanted uh, Oakley to come through. Uh, but it didn't, and we found out subsequently that it was because of a negative recommendation of all things. So uh, uh, Aspen Ranch in Loa was where uh, we were going to take Ryan. So we arranged uh, to have Ryan get on a flight out of uh, Boise, or maybe he got uh, driven down. It's not that far from Boise to Salt Lake City. But no, he flew down because I met him at the Salt Lake City airport. This was before 9-11, so there was still not the security issues that there were to come later that year. Uh, and uh, I picked him up and he was he was so heartwarmingly sweet when I picked him up. These three weeks in wilderness training, for whatever reason, seemed to really have a tremendous effect on him in a positive way. He was very sweet. He was actually looking forward to going down to Aspen Ranch. At, as far as he knew, it was a nice private school that he was going to go to. And he seemed very positive. And we had a wonderful three-hour drive down there, uh, except for the fact that I was heartbroken that this even had to happen uh, in the first place. 
Diane didn't come. It was just me and Ryan bringing him down there. And then I drove back to Salt Lake and, and flew back. And, and uh, Ryan entered Aspen Ranch. By the way, when he was at the Seuss program, uh, the wilderness training three weeks in the middle of nowhere, uh, he did see one of his classmates slit his wrist. And he never did find out if that person survived it or not. Uh, but, you know, it was, it was not a, a pleasant, happy experience necessarily, but it seemed to have a positive effect in the short term on Ryan. So Ryan went to Aspen Ranch. Uh, the name sounds sexier than the location, that's for sure. Uh, and uh, we, we went home. And uh, as we did uh, uh, for years to come, uh, uh, we could email him and emailed him virtually every day, just letting him know what's going on at home, encouraging him, uh, letting him know that uh, we still love him and that this is ultimately all for the good uh, and that uh, he should uh, make the most of it. And uh, while he was there, he could take coursework and work toward a degree or at least come back to Santa Barbara and not fall further behind. So that was good. All of that said, it was still a pretty stark, uh, tough place. And a lot of the kids there, a lot of, I use the word kids, but the teenagers there were, uh, uh, were having significant battles themselves. So uh, it, it was not a happy place, to be sure. We went there quite a number of times. I don't know how long Ryan was there. He's probably there for four, five, six months, something like that. But uh, we went there at least four times. Uh, fly to Salt Lake, rent a car, drive all the way down there to the middle of nowhere. And about half the times it's just to visit Ryan. They'll let you take him off campus and we could go to this. There's a little park in the area and we could spend the day at the park having a little picnic and just talking. It was, it was uh, uh, sweet to see him, but very, very heartbreaking as well to go through that. About half the time we were there because there was various uh, parents' weekends that were going on. And you would go through various group exercises that involved the, uh, uh, the uh, students there uh, and, and the faculty there. Uh, and they, uh, something that I remember probably more than anything from going to those was they would always put on student talent shows for the parents. And I remember how unbelievably struck I was by how talented so many of the people there were. Something that I learned later when I started meeting inmates and uh, God, the scores upon scores of times that we visited Ryan when he was incarcerated in different places and how the inmates were, they were just real people. They were decent, good people that made a mistake and were incarcerated. And uh, actually a very healthy experience for me because like probably a lot of other people, an inmate, when here's somebody's in prison, it conjures up a certain image. And I found uh, that to be quite different uh, in reality. But going back to Aspen Ranch, how talented so many of these people were, how creative they were. And there seemed to me there was a correlation between this creativity and this talent that people had uh, and some of the issues that they got themselves into. I mean, just look at a lot of the people in the entertainment industry over time and how often they get involved in addiction issues as well. There seems to be a high motor that creative people have that oftentimes can be dealt with through, uh, you know, through, uh, through addictive behavior, which is certainly what Ryan went through for a great many years. Uh, so in any event, we noticed that in Aspen as well. So uh, he, fi his, he, fi he finally did okay there and uh, was able to come home. And I remember I uh, uh, drove out to pick him up uh, and uh, uh, which is a long ways from Santa Barbara, probably uh, 11, 12 hours. But, uh, and for whatever reason, I decided that picking him up was best. There would be a decompression time that we could spend for you know, that many hours driving back to Santa Barbara. We actually stopped to see his uncle in Nevada on the way back, so we split it over two days. Uh, but Ryan did well there. And I remember overhearing a conversation he had when uh, shortly after he got home, he was on the phone with a, a, an old friend. And I remember he told the old friend that he says, I'm okay now, I'm good now, I'm behaving good now. And uh, so that was encouraging that uh, there was a positive result. I found out sometime later, months if not years later, that that uh, good times didn't last very long, probably a matter of days at best before he started getting back to bad habits. But that said, he was uh, readmitted back to Santa Barbara High 
It was after the beginning of the school year, but not that deep into it, maybe a month into it. Uh, and they were able to put him in classes that he could still get into and make up some work and so forth and so on. He actually did relatively well uh, that sophomore year. He completed his sophomore year. Uh, he was still doing things that, uh, uh, that were problematic. He was still doing addiction things. He was still misbehaving in a lot of ways by uh, you know, stealing from his parents and so forth and so on. Although I will say that he was always, at his credit, very respectful uh, to us, uh, you know, he may have been, uh, not, not that stealing is respectful, but, but I mean, you know, he, he was polite in talking to us always. So despite all the other problems, at least I always knew that, that there was this good, decent person inside him, which I, uh, I, I really took to heart. And over the years, over and over and over and over and over again, I kept reminding him uh, that he was that he was and is a very good person, and I think that's an important lesson for others as well. Is that when you go through addiction, when you go through incarceration, when you go through both, it's inevitable to have your uh, self-esteem shattered and then some. And it's really important not to participate in further shattering, but to let the other let let the addict let the uh, the person that's been convicted of something know that they're a good person, that uh, that addiction is a disease, that we're going to try to uh, get through this, and that he's going to try to get through it, or she's going to try to get through it, etc. So that was sort of the lesson that was going on uh, during this period of time. This was a year that spanned uh, 2001 and 2002. Uh, and uh, uh, the fall of 2002, uh, we did something that was interesting. Ryan was still doing relatively, relatively good compared to where he was as a freshman in the fall of 2001, but still, uh, uh, you know, still was uh, uh, having drug addiction issues, still was uh, getting in trouble in various ways. His school behavior and truancy wasn't as bad. There was some of it, I think, but it wasn't uh, nearly as bad. So. There were some positive things, but in that fall of uh, 2002, we had this very interesting bonding experience. And uh, we, uh, I, I speak a lot, I spoke a lot uh, uh, all over the country, and in this case, uh, uh, in Asia, I had a chance to, to make a presentation at an international conference in Taipei on Taiwan. And I thought, well, you know, here's a rare opportunity. I'd never been to the Orient, traveled very significant through this country in Europe, but had never been in that direction. And I, I thought to myself, well, let's see if we can get Ryan out of school for a week and uh, go out there for 10 days and spend some time in Taiwan, but also go to Beijing in China. It's a once in a lifetime thing. It would be a good thing for Ryan to see. And uh, uh, I think it would be a wonderful bonding experience for us just to be a father, son on our own for, uh, for that period of time in a foreign country. So. Uh, off we went, and uh, uh, fortunately, I was uh, flying so much during that period that uh, I could upgrade to first class all the time. So we had one wonderful travel experience going over there. Taiwan and Taipei was a whole lot of fun, uh, and very interesting for Ryan, very interesting for me. But then we went off to Beijing, and there was a classic moment there. Uh, we got off the airplane in Beijing, and. Uh, you know, I mean, China had always been this mysterious foreign state, uh, you know, that was so different than anything that I had ever experienced. So I was very anxious to, to see it. Uh, obviously concerned that, uh, you know, if I did something wrong or perceived to be wrong, we could wind up in a labor camp for 20 years or something. So we get off the plane, and just as we get off the runway and go into the terminal, there was this giant poster up on the wall, and uh, it said, uh, uh, possession of drugs are punishable by the death penalty in the, I believe it's called the People's Republic of China or whatever it's called. I don't remember exactly what it is, the DMK or something. Uh, and uh, and I, I made sure I put it Ryan and say, Ryan, if you have any ideas at all, read that sign carefully. So we actually, Ryan had a backpack with him, and you know, I had counseled Ryan very carefully, Ryan, whatever you do, don't bring anything with you uh, to China. That's uh, it's a whole different world, and it, it could be a total disaster. And he didn't. 
Uh, but he had this backpack and we have this incredible photo that we later made into a poster of him with his backpack and his back to me as I'm shooting the photo, uh, looking at the sign. So you see the sign and there's this young 15 year old, or a 16 year old by this point, looking up at the sign. Uh, and uh, uh, I can assure you that if Ryan had any ideas about, uh, about uh, anything concerning drugs while he was in China, he was quickly, uh, those ideas were quickly removed from his mind. So uh, that was that. I also remember that uh, uh, we, while I was over there, I bought this, this video camera because you can get things at a very, very good price. Uh, and it was hard, it was very inexpensive, wonderful, wonderful camera. Uh, so we started shooting photos, and not just photos, we started shooting videos. I brought a regular camera with me. And we were just walking around uh, Beijing, not far from the hotel we were staying at. And uh, there was a school there. And we said, hey, this is cool. And sort of walk around the school. And uh, it's one of those schools where there's a lot of outdoor campus, like, like a lot of Southern California uh, schools have. Uh, and we're walking around and I'm shooting videos. And uh, all of a sudden, some lady comes out and starts screaming and saying, you can't do that, you can't do that. But I mean, really screaming at me and theoretically at us, because Ryan's right there. So I said, Ryan, we got to get out of here. We got to get out of here fast. And Ryan said, well, what's the, what's the big deal? We're not doing anything wrong. I said, Ryan, let's go. And we got, and we, we ran away. I mean, we, I we not, I wouldn't say we ran, because then we'd probably really get in trouble. But we walked very quickly and got the heck out of there. But all in all, had a wonderful time. Uh, uh, in China. It was a wonderful uh, experience for us. Uh, came back. Ryan had to get back by Saturday night because it was his uh, prom. Uh, I'm thinking, how can it be the prom? I guess it may be homecoming because it was in, in the fall. It was in November. Uh, and I also remember that Ryan's date was with uh, a woman that was, uh, uh, she was a very significant uh, co-ed at Santa Barbara High. She was a varsity cheerleader, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so Ryan actually was showing some real potential to get in the mainstream in high school at that point. Uh, and he indeed uh, uh, did go to the prom, of course, messed around and got in some sort of trouble along the way. But uh, but, but that sort of ended, uh, ended that. That was the end of the trip. And that brought us uh, uh, toward the end of, uh, of 2002. Uh, shortly thereafter that, though, Ryan's uh, uh, problems started to become more extreme again with the drug addiction. Uh, he, and I may have dates somewhat off on this, but uh, somewhere along the way, he got a new girlfriend who was actually several years older than he was. So if he was 16, she was probably 18 or maybe 19 or so. And she was apparently significantly into cocaine and my, the heroin may have jumped into the picture a little bit at that point, I don't remember, but certainly cocaine became heavy. And some of his friends uh, uh, you know, were involved in it as well. And all sorts of weird things were happening. Uh, uh, weird phone calls that were occurring at, at various times. By this point, uh, ironically, Ryan had inherited uh, the Volvo that he had uh, mashed up, uh, still mashed up. I never did fix it, but ultimately Ryan had to have some sort of car. So he got that car, but different things happened. One night, uh, about 10 minutes of one, uh, got a phone call. Uh, it was a Sunday night, 10 minutes of one, and Ryan was out somewhere uh, doing something. Uh, and uh, uh, it was some good Samaritan that basically called on Ryan's phone and said, your son was just in a motor vehicle accident. He wasn't driving. Uh, it was, it was a, a, a female friend, a person that I actually liked a lot. And uh, uh, she was driving, but they, they were coming back from those from the area that are watching this were up at a party up near Dos Pueblos High School and were driving back to our neighborhood. And uh, she just lost control of the car and went smashing into an underpass cement wall. And uh, we have photos of her damaged uh, car and it was total beyond recognition. Ryan was in the drive, it was in the passenger seat. Uh, uh, a safety airbag certainly saved his life. Uh, and uh, uh, she said, he's being put in the ambulance now. It doesn't look like it's fatal. Uh, and we immediately got in the car and drove to the scene of the ambulance, five minutes, scene of the accident, about five minutes. But by that point, the ambulance had already gone to the local hospital. So we went there. Remember, I'm in healthcare, so I know hospitals pretty well. 
And we got there and Ryan was there and the family of the young lady uh, who I had met previously and nice people uh, were there as well. Emergency department, two in the morning on a, on a Sunday night. And, uh, uh, and Ryan uh, went uh, uh, AMA against medical advice. He said, I'm not staying here, I'm out of here, I'm going. Uh, and I'm not even sure if Ryan was living at home at that point. I just don't remember. He, he must have been used to going to high school. Uh, but uh, that was one example of uh, you know, sort of a shocking thing that happened that parents have to go through. And you know, it's very, very frightening when, when you hear somebody saying, uh, I have your son's phone call. He was just in a significant motor vehicle accident and the ambulances are just arriving. Uh, not the kind of thing you want to hear. Uh, analogously, again, on a Sunday night again, this was really strange. Uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, I hear our doorbell ring at midnight, and uh, look outside. And there's two police standing at the front on the front stoop outside our house. And uh, uh, before I have a chance to go down, they leave. And then, uh, shortly thereafter, I get a phone call, not from uh, the Santa Barbara Police Department, but from uh, uh, Contra Costa County, which is <coughs> Contra Costa County, which is in the East Bay. San Francisco, a good six hour drive from here <clears throat> in Santa Barbara. And they say that uh, uh, the, uh, that Ryan's Volvo has been totaled in a, in a car accident and that I should know about it. So I'm saying, well, because the car was in, I think the car was still in my name. It had to be still in my name. So that's the number they found and they, they called me about that. So I said, I, I don't know anything about this. I'm here in Santa Barbara. Uh, my son drives the car nowadays. So I immediately dialed Ryan's cell number as soon as I got off the phone. And uh, he answers. And there's laughter in the background and so forth and so on. And again, this is like 1230 on a Sunday night. And I, I said, Ryan, you know, where are you? And he says, I'm here at a party in Santa Barbara. I said, are you sure? I just found out that uh, your car has been totaled in Contra Costa County over near Oakland. And Ryan says, oh no. He, he actually lent the car to uh, some guy that said he had to go see his girl. He, had, he needed a car for that night. He didn't say anything about taking it to Northern California. He just said that he needed a car for that night. And Ryan is a good guy, very kind, generous guy. And he says, well, here's the keys. Go ahead, just to make sure you return it. And the guy takes off and goes, you know, 300 miles away and totals the car to boot. Uh, fortunately, the, uh, he came from a uh, affluent Hope Ranch family, and the father was uh, uh, really angry at his son, not at us, and, uh, you know, took care of all the expenses involved. And actually, Ryan came out ahead. He, got, he upgraded to a... Very nice car after I mean by that damaged Volvo standards at least standards, but it was another example of my gosh you know in the middle of the night hearing things like this and I could think of uh, numerous examples where I had to go pick Ryan up in the middle of the night for at various places for various reasons and all that, but you know by this point cell phones were totally commonplace just a few years later than when uh, I was one of the rare people that had one up in Portland, Oregon, as I discussed in the first video. Uh, so uh, here's, a, again, something that every parent goes through is that each and every time the phone rang, and I knew it was Ryan because he had his own spe special dial tone, a sense of panic sets in. Is he dead? Is he uh, uh, severely uh, affected in one way or another? Uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, is he in trouble? Is he in trouble with the police? Uh, what might be happening? And uh, so I, I really, uh, uh, you know, we really suffered a lot just from day to day, uh, feeling almost everything in the house had to be nailed down or else he could take it and, and, and put it toward money. And again, this was comparatively speaking, not the worst era, but he was starting to tumble downhill again, following uh, the, uh, the trip to, uh, Beijing in November of 2002. Uh, so that's, uh, that's about it. When, when I go into video number three, what I want to talk about is what happened in, uh, in early 2003 and some very significant things happened. Ryan took another little road trip to another state for another round of rehab. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of events that led to that to happen in the first place. So 
Again, it's my pleasure and privilege to have the chance to talk to people that follow Ryan, follow Ryan's YouTube channel, and to share what the experience of a parent is going through uh, uh, something as challenging as your only child's addiction. So I'll see you next time. Thanks. Palabra. <laughs>